alive in here, so if you could keep it down, <laughs> we'll get a better recording. Anyway, um, good afternoon. I'm Michael Henning. I'm on the board here, and uh, we're delighted to host a talk by Christopher Wiegren. Uh, and the event is being recorded by Richard Griggs over here so that we can put it on our website uh, eventually and more people will be able to have access to it. Chris is an architectural historian and the deputy director of Preserve Connecticut, formerly known as the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation, established almost 50 years ago to protect, promote buildings, sites, structures, landscapes, they contribute to the heritage and vitality of the Connecticut community. He's recently completed a survey, or is working on a survey, of Frederick Law Homestead's landscape designs in Connecticut, and previously written essays covering a, a wide range of, you can tell me if I'm wrong in any of this, architectural subjects from the work of pioneering architect, uh, woman architect, Alice Washburn, in the 1920s, to the successes and failures of the urban renewal of the 1960s. He's the author of the book, Connecticut Architecture, Stories of 100 Places, which we have here, and which he's here to talk about. The book is a comprehensive look at Connecticut architecture from the landscapes of small farms and country churches, urban streets, tobacco sheds, maritime villages, and town greens, to more recent suburbs and corporate headquarters. In addition to being an analysis and guide to Connecticut's rich and diverse architectural heritage, it's a kind of treatise on uh, how our landscape shapes human endeavors and then how, in turn, men and women have shaped Connecticut's landscape. After the talk, we have a few copies of Chris's book, which he's agreed to sign and you can buy. And I hope you will also have a chance to look at these shows uh, and also to sign our guest book. Please welcome Christopher Weaver. The architecture we look at is diverse and varied. Um, I define architecture, the art of architecture, as, as making places, um, shaping our environment to provide shelter, to accommodate the activities of our society and our households, and as a means of, of self-expression as well. It's not just buildings, it's landscapes, engineering structures like bridges, or dams, community plans, uh, and interior designs. Why is architecture important? Well, first of all, human beings have bodies, and those bodies occupy space. And the nature of the space that we're in can make a difference to us. It can be comfortable or uncomfortable. It can further our activities or frustrate them. It can ennoble us or debase us. How we design and build places can affect the quality of our lives, sometimes in ways that are crucial to our well-being. One example is the Connecticut Hospice in Branford, which was designed to shelter people at a particularly difficult and traumatic time, not only for patients, but also for their friends and families and for the people who are there to care for them. And so the design of the building incorporates places not only for patients to be, but for gathering families, for staff support, and, and it provides sort of quiet getaway places when things get intense and you just need to be alone and, and catch your breath for a moment. Similarly, urban renewal programs in the 1950s and 60s were grounded on the confidence that architecture could help solve social ills. 
belief that was tragically overstated to the ongoing distress of cities like Hartford and New Haven. There we see a photograph showing planning for cutting Ground 84 through the center of Hartford and the broad areas of demolition that were carried out to accommodate that and to um, tear down buildings seen as unhealthful and unuseful and to build new. But even the failures of urban renewal demonstrate the power that places have to affect our lives and so that how we shape them matters. A second reason that architecture is important, I think, is that I believe humans have an innate urge to create, to make things. Our reaction to the places in which we find ourselves is not passive. We want to manipulate and alter our environment, the materials that we find. If a place is uncomfortable or hinders a desired activity, we try to make it more comfortable, more conducive, or maybe just more attractive. So creating is not just an artistic uh, activity like painting or sculpture. Uh, it might mean doing carpentry or setting up a classification system for a library or writing an instruction manual. Whether it's physical or mental activity, it's a way in which we reshape our world. And we all do it, starting with the talker who smears paint food on the wall and says, look at that, see what I've done. Um, how we shape the physical world says a lot about how we see it and how we see our place in it um, and perhaps how we want other people to see who we are in it as well. Um, so that it's, it's a very human activity and looking at the places that humans have created, I think, can help us maybe to understand them as well. Uh, here we've just got a, a heating grate, believe it or not, in the Warner Theater. Um, and Mark Twain's house in Hartford, uh, decorated by um, United Artists, firm led by Louis Comfort Tiffany, in the, the most avant-garde uh, interior decoration style in the state in the 1880s. Um, and something that, you know, that it, again, was sort of expressing Twain, the, the poor boy who grew up and became a famous author, uh, his place in, in society in the literary world. So to help the people of Connecticut look at the architecture of the state, um, I decided to tell some stories that are embodied in works of architecture. I chose 100 places that together began to tell the story of how the people of Connecticut have built. Buildings, landscapes, towns, neighborhoods, engineering structures. And the book is supposed to do a couple of things. First of all, to illustrate the variety of Connecticut architecture. It's much more than colonial houses or meeting houses. And second, to help people look at some of the different ways there are of looking at architecture. It's not just what style is it, okay, move on to the next building, um, but there are other stories that works of architecture can tell. And third, to enhance Preservation Connecticut's mission, to make the case for appreciating and preserving and being good stewards of significant architecture from the past. So each play of the 100 places tries to focus on a single identifiable short story. Some of them could be whole books in themselves, actually. And then they're divided into chapters uh, by themes rather than chronology. So what I'm going to do is run through the, the 12 chapters, the 12 themes, um, briefly describe them, and then read a few of the individual entries. So architecture begins with the land. Its topography and the materials it provides begin to determine what and how we build. But we, in turn, shape the land as well. For most people, the most obvious way this happens is creating gardens or landscapes around places where we live, like Philip Johnson's glass house in New Canaan, which he's been, he tinkered at the landscape there for 50 years gradually changing things, adding buildings, cutting down a lot of trees. Um, but we shape the land in much bigger ways as well, such as the Mark Hampstead Reservoir, where you know, an entire valley was flooded to make, uh, to supply water for the city of Hartford. Um, and then the, the 
dam that creates the, the lake there uh, has a road running along it with stone walls on the road and this little building housing and some of the mechanism there are designed as, as kind of a view catcher so that it's designed to be attractive as well. In recent years, we've begun to pay more attention to the effect that our building has on the land and to construct buildings that are sustainable, that are less wasteful in their use of materials and resources, more careful not to pollute. One example of that is Croon Hall at Yale, part of the forestry school, uh, which was designed to be as energy efficient uh, as possible in its operation through um, good insulation, uh, systems that turn lights on and off depending on whether or not they're needed uh, without people around to do it. Um, but also to reduce the amount of energy that was involved in actually constructing the building. So they tried to source materials that were close by. So the, the gasoline spent in transporting, say, the building stone uh, was minimized. Uh, the, some of the insulation is actually made from chewed up blue jeans uh, for <laughs> recycling. So reused materials. So that's the way that buildings have changed to reflect our changing view of the environment. A second theme is materials. What we use to build with and the technologies that we use to assemble them. We've used the traditional materials that come more or less directly from the earth, like wood. That's the courthouse in London on the top left there. Uh, built of wood in the 1780s, which you can see that it's got these blocks over the at the corner and over the windows that are imitating stone. We've got actual stone, Portland, uh, on the Connecticut River, what had these great brownstone quarries that shipped stone far away. Um, large, large areas of New York are built of brownstone, so much that brownstone came the term for a row house, no matter what it was built out of. Um, there's even Portland brownstone um, on Knob Hill in San Francisco in the 1860s. In the 19th century, newer materials were developed through industrial processes, uh, such as cast iron used for the Lover's Leap Bridge in New Milford. And then in modern technology, such as prefabrication, the little house in New London was an example of prefabrication in the 1930s, where architects and builders tried to harness the principle of factory assembly line production to reduce the cost of housing, to make houses more affordable for everyday people. So that little house was built out of um, enameled steel panels that were assembled on, in predetermined sizes that could be uh, then put together to form a house. Indeed, places to live have been among the most widespread uh, works of architecture from the very first. And it's not just the province of the rich. We have modest houses from the 18th century. The little house in Guilford there um, has a footprint of about 600 square feet. That's an average size house for the 18th century. All these big center chimney houses, and center hall houses, those are the really big, folk, big folks' houses from the time. The smaller ones either got expanded over time so that they're less easy to see as 18th century examples, or they just were torn down and replaced. Um, we also have, in Hartford, there's a very typical type called the Perfect Six. It's like a Boston triple decker, but two of them match together, two units per floor for three units. So those are working class to middle class housing, and a, a type of building that is really specialized for Hartford. Technology in the 1890s and on connect, contributed to the way buildings were built. This is the cellar plan from a house in Wethersfield in the 1890s, and it shows heating apparatus and plumbing and sewage and waste from the kitchen, um, cast iron posts, showing the, all these things that were being incorporated into house designs that hadn't been used much before that. So that Building a building becomes not just a matter of putting up the, the structure to keep the, the weather out and to provide space that you're in, but now you have to incorporate all these mechanical systems as well 
and that changes the way that buildings are designed. And then government regulations affected the way people were, where the people built. It was only in the 1960s that laws were passed to create condominium ownership. And so beginning about the mid-60s, we did condominium developments. And a new idea that would have been absolutely baffling to 18th century ancestors, the idea of the age-restricted developments, like Heritage Village in Southbury. Um, you know, we have to be 50 years old to move in. Agriculture has played important roles in Connecticut's economy and life. There have been general purpose farms, like that of Cyrus Wilson in Carleton. Um, house barn, there's another barn just outside of the picture there, and the windmill to pump water for the cattle. Um, rich gentlemen farmers help spread the youth, word of new developments in agriculture and commissioned monumental farm buildings like Hilltop Dairy Barn in Suffield. That's the building there on the top. So the, uh, the rich faculty, a factory owner who built himself a farm and raised cattle as, as a sort of hobby. And so his, his dairy barn is, is a real sort of cathedral for cows with all the latest gadgets and technologies built into it. Tobacco growing became a specialty in the Connecticut Valley contributing not only the to distinctive tobacco sheds, like the one on the lower left there, but an entire landscape of fields and shade curtains designed to shade the tobacco to give it the right environment in which it will grow best. And then there are the agricultural specialists at the University of Connecticut who helped develop new and better types of agricultural buildings, such as the poultry house on the top left there in Lebanon, designed by a Yukon professor for the family who raised chickens there. Connecticut was a leader in the American Industrial Revolution, and Connecticut industrialists added buildings for production to the state's landscape. Many of them were multi-purpose loft buildings, such as the Hawken and Willen Mill in Rockville, on the far left there, sort of a multi-story, general-purpose building that could accommodate a number of industrial processes so as technologies, as needs, as markets change, a woolen mill could move out, and a company that made parlor organs could move in and use the same space. But there are also more specialized buildings, such as the shop tower in Bridgeport. You, you pour molten lead through a sort of colony, or giant colony at the top of the tower, and as the droplets of lead fall uh, several stories to a bucket of water, essentially at the bottom, a tub of water, um, they fruit, they harden it into a lead shot. So then we had the iron industry in uh, Litchfield County, that's Beckley Furnace, um, and um, and then not only factories and, and manufacturing buildings like these, but entire communities that would grow up, such as Collinsville and Canton, where built. The factory was built at a site where there was water power available, but there was no existing accommodation. So the factory owner, in this case the Collins Axe Company, not only had to build their factories, but they had to build housing for workers uh, to attract workers there. So we have factory villages all over the state um, that exist really only because uh, there was an industry there. As Collinsville shows, architecture can be more than individual structures, but how they're assembled into larger constructions, where the whole very often is greater than some of its parts. New Haven's Green, on the left there, is an example, ambitious example of 17th century town planning and 19th century town improvement. Uh, originally a marketplace, purely uh, functional, uh, utilitarian, uh, but then in the 18 teens, uh, three very grand, stylish churches were built there. Uh, trees were planted, uh, the grass and the fence put around it uh, to create a landscape that has survived almost totally unchanged for the 200 years since then. During World War I, uh, the builders of Bridgeport Seaside Village, which was emergency war housing for, for munitions workers, so the big explosion of need for manufacturing uh, armaments for World War I. Uh, the government built 
housing to accommodate all of these workers. Uh, but the architects and planners had an ulterior motive. They wanted to demonstrate good examples of housing that would be useful and influential, they hoped, once the war was over. So the architects here also, non-media architects, restoration architects for Colonial Williamsburg. So you can see they're already practicing their Virginia colonial design. Mm -hmm. Urban renewal, as I said, drastically remade our cities <coughs> in the 20th century, creating enclosed complexes often that were sort of isolated from the surrounding city, like Constitution Plaza in Hartford. And that sparked a reaction that encouraged the preservation movement and produced more traditional looking developments, like Blueback Square in West Hartford, which has the appearance of a traditional downtown with buildings that line streets, parallel parking along the streets, um, outdoors, not indoors, and yet it's all under single ownership like a shopping mall. Transportation needs have given us specialized building types. Uh, there's a canal uh, built to skirt around the falls on the Connecticut River um, for easier, easier shipping of goods and, and travel by people. Uh, and it also provided water power for factories in Windsor Locks. Uh, we have buildings such as the railroad station in New London, designed by the great American architect H.H. H. Richardson, uh, and modern transportation support structures like motels on the Berlin Turnpike in, in um, Newington there. And transportation routes can also be sort of corridors along which architectural ideas move. The house here is in Thompson, the very far northeast corner of Connecticut. Um, but it looks a lot like the work of an architect in, from Providence named John Holden Green. Well, it just so happens that the turnpike from Providence to Hartford went right through Thompson. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, somebody went to Providence, saw Green's work, may have gotten him to design this house, or they may have just, you know, gotten enough of the idea to commission a local builder to create something like it. But the monitor on the roof and some of the details around the door are very, very like Green's work from the 18 teens and 20s in Providence. Architecture can serve mental, emotional, and spiritual needs. Um, certainly there are buildings for religious worship Meeting houses like the Weathersfields on the far left there, built in the 1760s. Um, other so, 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 social, per, social service buildings, the middle one there is an alms house in Middletown, uh, constructed to house Middletown's poor uh, in the 18, 18 teens or whatever. Um, the, Institute of Living, originally known as the Connecticut Asylum for the Insane in Hartford, was one of the first uh, insane asylums, hospitals for the mentally ill, we would say now, uh, in, in the country, established in the 1820s. Um, by the 1860s, uh, the director of the, of the institution wanted to redesign, have the landscape redesigned to uh, serve as a a peaceful, healthful, healing environment for, for the patients that the 19th century believed very strongly in sort of the human power of nature. And so he commissioned uh, Frederick Law Olmsted to redesign the landscape. Um, Olmsted and his partner, Calvert Fox, uh, started the design work. The Civil War started it, and he went off to do other things. And the local Hartford landscape architect finished the design executed it. So this is his drawing, uh, Frederick Wyden's drawing for the, the landscape there, but a lot of the ideas are homesteads as well. The landscape survives and can still be visited. And then we've got um, a building in Hartford, uh, not for Danbury, that was designed as a, a school by Warren Briggs, an architect from Bridgeport, who sort of set himself up as an expert in school design. He published a book about how to design schools that was published in 1898. This is an illustration from the book. 
And he talks a lot about you know, what's the right classroom size, how big should the windows be, what kind of feeding and ventilation those technological building systems as well. Um, how should they be, be, what are the needs for them for, for a school? So that this is one of these model schools that's illustrating all his ideas of how a school should be built. The school was built, it's still a school in Danbury. And you can tell fascinating stories about who builds and who is built for clients and, and how they interact. Um, the house on the left was uh, built by a man named uh, William Spratz, who came to Connecticut as a member of the British Army during the Revolution. He, he had a background in building. Uh, he was captured, uh, was kept as a prisoner in Litchfield, and uh, when the war ended, he stayed. Built buildings in Litchfield, and um, some over in eastern Connecticut as well. Um, that one is, is in East Haddam, uh, but for the brother of one of his Litchfield clients. And um, eventually then moved to Vermont. So that's one story. Uh, Avon Old Farm School in Avon, designed by Theodore Pope, uh, one of the first women to practice architecture professionally. Um, she was a head of member of a wealthy family, and her parents hired McKinney and White to tutor her in architecture. And so she designed their own house, Hillstead, and then other buildings, including the school buildings at Avon Old Farms. Um, what's built is often determined less by builders or architects than by developers. P.T. Barnum created several neighborhoods in Bridgeport, and suburban developers after World War II unrolled housing subdivisions across the countryside. This is Broadview Lane in East Windsor, um, article published in a magazine for home developers in the 1950s, which you can see proclaims 53 house sellout in 30 hours, and goes on to talk about how the houses were designed to be, A, economical to construct, you know, sort of saving by using standardized sizes of things, and, and uh, economies of scale and building 53 houses, once, but also what features are going to be most attractive to buyers? What are we going to, how can we design this house to make people want to buy it? Uh, so the, the, the magazine House and Home actually held round tables where architects and developers could talk about what worked and what seemed to attract buyers and what seemed to turn people off and what seemed to make be the most uh, to make the most money for the developers. So you can learn a lot about how the houses some of us grew up in uh, were shaped you know, as, as a marketing tool, not just as architectural styles or even what they cost to the buyers. Connecticut's identity is still very much tied up with its colonial past, and we're still learning more about it. The Barolf Williams house, the interior photo there on the left is in Weathersfield. Um, and when I moved to Connecticut in the 1980s, uh, went there and visited and was told about how that house had been built in 1670. Um, more careful research followed, and uh, it's now determined that it was built more like about 1750. But the thing is, that Connecticut in the 18th century was stylistically conservative. So that this looked like a 1670s house from Massachusetts, but by 1715, Massachusetts had sort of moved on to other things, and Connecticut was still building um, these sort of stylistically conservative buildings, which matches the theological conservatism of a lot of Connecticut congregationalists at the same time. So you begin to get sort of connections there. In the early 20th century, um, appreciation for this colonial heritage grew. And we saw the beginnings of a restoration movement. So this is the Highland House in Guilford, which was being restored in 1916. Uh, it was one of the first colonial house museums that was set up as a museum because of its architecture, not because George Washington lived here or, or some of the early settlers lived here. So uh, this is the during and after photos of the restoration of the Highland House. And at the same time, uh, architecture of the colonial and early national periods uh, became an inspiration for the construction of new buildings. 
So this is Waterbury's Town Hall, also 1916, the same year that the Highland House is being restored, um, designed really to, as, as a statement of Waterbury's colonial history, as, as an old, old community established by Puritans, even though by 1916 it was a thriving industrial city uh, with inhabitants from many, many countries all over the world. Um, but the image that the city wanted to protect, project to the world was still this colonial, early American heritage. So, what, does, so what does architecture say about um, the people who own it, who use it? Uh, like what kind of message, like Waterbury City Hall, does it project? Um, you can look at the state capitol in Hartford, built in the 1870s. Again, a very imposing statement of wealth and prosperity. Uh, but if you look at how the capitol is designed, that also says something about the workings of government. That an awful lot of the space inside that building is corridors and sort of open spaces um, staircases that twist and turn and have lots of landings where you can stand. It's a building that's built not only for formal meetings of the legislature in the House or Senate chamber, but also for lobbying in all these lobbies where you can have informal conversations and stop and chat with your representative or with the representative of the trade association or somebody who's trying to get uh, legislation passed or to affect the way legislation happens. So that it is, it's also that informal aspect of the building that makes up the legislative process that it makes a lot of space for when you go through the capital. The Mashantucket Pequot Museum in Ledger, uh, designed with the, the proceeds from casino wealth, uh, you know, are a way of, re, again, re, restating that the position of the Mashantucket Pequot tribe ha has in the state that they're not no longer just the, the poor people living in the backwoods and the trailers who are mostly forgotten. They're a reminder that they're an important part of Connecticut's history and that they're still here and with us. And their history is important, so they built this huge museum complex um, that spent a lot of money on it and um, hire a, a nationally known important architect to design it. Um, and according to the architect, at least, this design with sort of the rectangular panels and the, the light, the dark pattern making is supposed to uh, resemble Wombo. So it's a statement again of, of Native American culture. And then there's the question of style. What style is it? Which is often the first question and the last question people ask about a building. Um, but I think style is, is kind of a language or a menu that you can choose options from. You know, or like a language is better because it's got a vocabulary. It's got things that, that are used and then ways that are put together like grammar to, to make a statement. So we've got two houses in Plainville that are both built within a couple of years of each other. They're both, if you're going to give them a label, they've got the same style. It's called Second Empire, sort of based on French design from the Renaissance with these steep roofs. It's a lot of the attention on it and then some sort of classical uh, influences on it as well. Um, I've tried to adjust the photographs that you've got the actual relationship in size between the two houses. One of them's a lot bigger than the other. Um, and then it's just sort of the, the impression they're giving, the message that they're passing on. This one has a lot of sort of flat surfaces. You can see it's sort of smooth, uh, but then it's tied together by this cornice that runs across. Uh, there's that window and it's sort of deep recess there, um, and it, it's, it's a, a, a fairly serious, imposing building. Well, this one, uh, it's got lots more sort of jazzy things happening to it. Uh, and when it was new, uh, a local writer referred to it as a tasty little residence. And, and you sort of get that feeling, and, you know, this one's, this one's got a, a more lively, tasty kind of uh, impression. It you simply you can give you, you can use the same style to communicate two different messages with your building. Aren't they also Palladian? Yeah. I mean, right? Um, 
In what way? What, what do you see? Well, oh, symmetry. Symmetry, yeah. Symmetry comes in a, in a lot of a lot of times. So not just play in the thing. Um, so you know, symmetry, and then there's not really much cla overt classicism. On them. The, frankly, the, the kind of Italian smooth walls with isolated openings. That's there's a little plot in there, but the, the, again, that goes into other things as well. And then works of architecture grow and change. And can it be adapted to new uses? Um, the Tainter House in Hampton there um, traces the changing tastes of a single family over more than 150 years. Uh, it was originally built in the 1760s as a center chimney house. Around 1800, it was remodeled. The chimney was ripped out, and two, two chimneys added. And so there was a center hall right into the middle of the building now. Um, but you still have the, the windows plus 212 that you see in a lot of colonial houses. Uh, and then in the 1860s or so, uh, the, the first floor got remodeled with the windows lengthened. It's a little hard to see, but more elaborate um, door and window surrounds and that porch wrapping around it. So you've got a house that's a little bit schizophrenic. It's 1860 on the first floor and 1800 on the second floor. Uh, but that begins to help you understand the changing tastes, the um, perhaps rise in, in uh, prosperity of the family that maybe had a limit. But, you know, they, they, they were prosperous enough to remodel the first floor, but they ran out of steam when they got into the upstairs. Um, a bigger scale of transformation is Naugatuck, where factory owner, industrialist Howard Whittemore, um, through position and leadership in the community and personal philanthropy um, brought in the firm of McKinney and White to design a number of buildings such as a school, um, a church, a library, another school. They re-landscaped the town green with the help of the Olmsted firm, uh, did a design for a town hall that was not built, um, a couple banks, so that the downtown Naugatuck was, was very much changed from a sort of red brick in Victorian industrial town to a pale stone uh, classical style um, early Edwardian, Edwardian community. So a very big change, community-wide change. And then the preservation movement um, has sponsored transformation of buildings deemed historic. The brick building on the bottom there was a dye house for the Cheney Brothers Silk Mill in Manchester. Um, and then with uh, historic preservation tax credits and funding sources, that's been converted to housing. Um, to housing now, allowing the building to continue to be part of the community, but to serve a vastly different purpose. Um, and the once sort of open factory space divided up into apartments inside. So those are the, the basic themes that I cover in the book. Um, and now I'm going to read a few of the individual entries. Um, and since it's summertime, I've sort of got a summer recreational kind of theme growing with them. So we're going to start on the shore uh, with New London Harbor and Ledge Lighthouses. Houses. In the century separating these two lighthouses in New London, lighthouse construction changed significantly. From the time of the first European settlement, um, Maritime transportation was crucial to the development of commerce, defense, and communications. The sailing could be dangerous. Shoals and le ledges were hazards, and important harbors and rivers needed to be identified. As an aid to navigation, Connecticut built the fourth lighthouse in the Americas in New London in 1760 to mark the entrance to Connecticut's deepest harbor. By 1800, that structure had developed serious cracks, and the United States Treasury Department commissioned a replacement in 1801. The new lighthouse was an octagonal stone tower, 89 feet tall, not much different from medieval lighthouses or even the ancient lighthouse, ancient ones. It had thick walls and a tapering form to give it stability against wind and waves. The original light was an oil lamp with a reflector housed in an iron and glass lantern atop the tower. 
The lantern was replaced in 1833, and new lights were installed as technology improved, with oil giving way to acetylene, and then electricity, and more powerful lenses being devised. But the tower itself remains essentially unchanged. Next to it is the Keeper's House, built in 1863. Other buildings on the site no longer extant included a barn and an oil storage shed. Throughout the first half of the 19th century, American lighthouses lagged behind European ones technologically, owing to neglect by the Treasury Department, which had assumed responsibility for the buildings, but which did not consider them a major priority. In 1852, Congress created a separate lighthouse board, which pursued improvements more aggressively. The board introduced new equipment and new types of lighthouses. By the 1870s, the most common form was a house-like structure with the light on its roof. This was more stable in exposed locations than a tower, and it provided sheltered access to the light from the keeper's quarters. From the 1880s to the 1920s, a third type, a truncated cone formed of prefabricated cast iron plates, dominated lighthouse building. Prefabrication simplified construction, particularly in offshore locations, and standardized design saved money. The board returned to the house form, though, when a new lighthouse was built at New London in 1909 to mark an underwater ledge at the mouth of the harbor. At the same time, it experimented with an innovative type of construction. Instead of cast iron, this new lighthouse used concrete and steel I-beams in its structure. Reinforced concrete was just emerging as a building material. The first lighthouse to employ it had gone up only a year before on the Pacific coast. And industrial designers were beginning to use concrete for factories. New London's lighthouses look quite different from each other. One, a traditional stone tower. The other one, resembling a house with an oversized cupola, somehow stranded in the middle of the harbor. Unexpectedly, this difference has little to do with their primary function, which is to cast a bright light for a long distance, or even with advances in lighting technology. Instead, the difference is one of changes in construction practices. We saw the shift from stone to iron to concrete, and to shift in planning, which allowed direct, keepers direct access to the quarters from the light, even in bad weather. This is the New Haven campground in Plainville. Although suburban houses crowd around it, the Plainville campground still feels like a peaceful retreat from the busy world. It has been that since its founding in 1865 by the New Haven District of the Methodist Episcopal Church as a place to find tranquility and reconnect with God. The campground traces its lineage to frontier revival meetings held at the close of the 18th century. Intended as religious events, camp meetings from the first also provided an escape from daily routines. For city dwellers, they offered access to nature. For isolated rural folk, a chance to socialize. In other words, they were forerunners to vacations. Beginning in the 1830s, many of these temporary gatherings became institutionalized as multi-day annual events held at permanent campgrounds with a distinct arrangement and architecture. The model for many of them was the campground at Oak Bluffs in Martha's Vineyard. Like that one, the Plainville campground has an open pavilion at its center. Uh, Plainville was built in 1902, um, with, this, with, this, with cottages arranged in circles around that, around that building. The gingerbread cottages follow the model developed in Martha's Vineyard. Toy-like frame buildings with a narrow end to the street and wide double doors often opening to a front porch or platform. The tightly packed cottages with their big porches and wide open doors fostered social interaction, 
Above all, camp meetings were and are communal events. This cottage form evolved from tents used at the earlier camp meetings, which were erected on platforms and opened in the daytime, and which often bore decorative trim. With their small size, light construction, and plentiful but fragile ornament, the cottages not only followed the plan and decoration of the tents, but also their sense of insubstantiality, which means that many of them survived well to the present. The form was early on copied for secular vacation cottages as well, and examples can be seen in many of Connecticut's 19th century lakeside and seaside resorts built by vacationers from New York or from the state's own cities. Most of the cottages at Plainville were built between about 1880 and 1910, a few as late as 1925. Their wooded setting is important. Camp meeting planners typically chose groves for their cooling shade and sense of enclosure and intimacy. Like most of its peers, the Plainville campground gradually became secularized. By 1901, it offered Chautauquas, educational and cultural programs that don't necessarily have religious connotations. In 1957, the Methodist Church sold the plant campground to a non-denominational association that holds the land and leases lots to cottage owners. While the association continues to offer religious events, the campground's focus remains the distinctive combination of nature and society that has defined it since 1865. Anybody know where Buddhist is? It's East Haddon, just the one. In the middle of the 20th century, the area around the towns of East Haddam and Colchester came to be called the Connecticut Catskills. This nickname recognized the many summer resorts in that area that, like their better known counterparts in New York, catered to a predominantly Jewish clientele. These resorts grew out of earlier efforts to help Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe settle as farmers away from big city crowding and squalor. To supplement their income, many of these farmers took in summer boarders. While this practice crossed ethnic lines, it was particularly advantageous for Jews since it ensured access to synagogues and kosher food and avoided anti-Semitism. Over the years, some of the farms grew into full-fledged resorts that offered accommodations in larger hotels or separate cottages, meals and dining halls, more elaborate recreational facilities, and professional entertainment. Although the resorts varied in elaborateness and price, they mostly catered to a middle class and working class clientele from the Northeast. One of the larger resorts was Orchard Mansions near Moodus, a village in the town of East Haddam. Its story dates to 1926, when Morris Mayer took out a mortgage to buy a farm, a 46-acre farm that included a big green revival farmhouse, a 20th century barn, just um, there, an apple orchard, um, and fields. It's not clear when Baker began taking in guests, but by the mid-1930s, the farm had become a resort. The barn was converted to a social center. A rambling one-story building was built to house dining rooms and a kitchen, and rows of small cabins lined the edges of the lawns. The property expanded to 62 acres, also offering a swimming pool, play equipment, and eventually a television room. It's still there? It's still there, yeah. Um, it's not called Orchard Mansions anymore. Uh, one vacationer described it, the rooms were simple, the beds were hardly <coughs> firm, and hot showers were at a premium. But people were not there for the amenities. They were working class Jews who needed a break and stumbled upon a good deal. For my parents, small business owners, it was heaven. Fresh country air, a big swimming pool, camp for the kids, and some quiet time they couldn't get in the city. The time was spent outdoors, mostly at the pool, and often, in a matter of hours, complete strangers who had randomly chosen lounge chairs were chatting away like lifelong friends. That's the, the description now. 
So Baker's daughter and son-in-law, Rose and Morris Kabatsnik, continued operating Orchard Mansions until 1972. After sitting vacant uh, for a few years, it was reopened in 1984 as my father's house, a Catholic retreat center. Uh, I haven't been there in a couple of years, but as far as I know, it's still a retreat center. Um, but Orchard Mansion is a little changed, and its agricultural origins remain obvious. The old farmhouse and the gamble-roofed barn are the most prominent structures on the property. And other buildings, loosely clustered around them, look like farm sheds or outbuildings. Most of the property remains as open fields, now used for camp activities instead of crops or grazing. But the informality and farm-like character serve as reminders of the attractions that Orchard Mansion and resorts like it offer. Fresh air, fresh food, sociability, and the simple life. Where is Moody's? It's in East Haddam. Um, you know where um, the Opera House? Goodspeed? Goodspeed Opera House is. It's, it's a couple miles from there. This is a little closer. closer to home. As soon as automobiles were invented, drivers began racing them. As with horses, some raced on enclosed tracks, while others preferred, preferred open country roads with their more challenging configurations and better scenery. By the 1950s, the dangers of this latter practice led to the development of tracks that evoked the experience of open road racing, but in a controlled environment. One of the first of these was built at Lime Rock, a rural village in the town of Salisbury that had been the headquarters of the Litchfield County iron industry. There, sports car enthusiast Jim Vale had taken to driving in the gravel pit he operated on his father's land. Deciding to build a proper track, Vale enlisted John Fitch, a race car driver who had witnessed terrible crashes and was committed to making racing safer. Fitch, in turn, brought in engineers from the Cornell Aeronautical Engineering Laboratory to review the layout and recommend safety improvements to protect both drivers and spectators. It seems the lab's director, Bill Milliken, was a racing fan. The resulting racetrack is a mile and a half long and has seven curves of varying shapes and combinations to test the driver's skill. The design takes into account the engineer's recommendations for curvature, banking, elevation. They also called for recovery and deceleration lines wide and long enough to give drivers a chance to regain control or slow down so the collisions wouldn't cause serious injury to drivers or damage to cars. Barriers were designed to stop cars safely, to be portable and replaceable, and to allow emergency access for, to disabled vehicles. The involvement of the Cornell Lab at Line Rock was a first in racetrack design and a reflection of the founder's broader intentions to shape the still new sport of automobile racing. As Fitch told the local newspaper, we plan to make Mount Rock an outdoor laboratory for highway safety in the automotive industry. And we're confident that some of the safety features we're now working on will be perfected so that they will be applicable to public highways. Along with the safety features, the landscape defines Lime Rock. Unlike other racetracks, it does has no grandstands. Instead, spectators sit on grassy slopes dotted with trees and screened by rows of pines. There are views to a church steeple in the village and beyond that to rolling hills in the distance. The park-like setting makes going to the races an informal, festive event. There's space to arrange picnic blankets and chairs in the shade or the sun. Children can sleep or play while grown-ups watch the races. Spectators can move about easily to watch the action from different vantage points. Much thought went into the making of Lime Rock Park. In addition to engineering the racetrack to balance safety with thrills, all the practical needs of drainage, screening, parking, and crowd control had to be satisfied. Most important was integrating these practical necessities 
with the beauty of the natural surroundings to create an inviting setting for the fun of watching the races. The crowds that flock to Lion Rock attest to the success of its creators. So as I hope I've made clear, Lion Rock is a designed landscape, something that's been a lot on my mind lately. Uh, so I'm going to interrupt this to talk a little bit about a more recent project. 2022 was the 200th birthday of Frederick Law Homestead, born in Hartford, um, father of the American profession of landscape architecture, designer of Central Park, the grounds of the United States Capitol, and hundreds of other places around the country. Homestead founded a firm that continued after his death uh, under the leadership of his sons. In all, it operated from about 1860 to 1979 and all along was a leader in the profession for decades. In observance of this anniversary, Preservation Connecticut and the Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office commissioned a study outlining the history of Olmsted and the Olmsted firm, its personal and professional relationships to Connecticut, and uh, attempting to find and evaluate the firm's surviving works in the state. There are 300 job files in the firm records for Connecticut, and we found more than 100 that had recognizable elements in them. You can read about that online <coughs> through Preservation Connecticut's website. So now back to our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> Examples of some of the stories that architecture can tell them. Um, Lighthouses that were essential to commerce and travel safety and also reflected changing technologies and construction, methods of construction. Camp meetings uh, with revivals that helped to shape the idea of the vacation uh, for Americans. Orchard Mansion, which showed different populations moving into Connecticut and using existing places that they adapted to new purposes. And then Lime Rock in the landscape uh, for sport, a uh, different uh, kind of landscape design is different from garden. Places like these, with stories like these, are a living record of the people of Connecticut and the lives they have pursued. They've tried many ways of making their living. They've absorbed influences from other places and periods. They've been intellectually curious and prosperous enough to keep up with and sometimes contribute to changing fashion. As the 19th and 20th centuries progressed, the state's population grew ever more diverse socially and ethnically, introducing new tastes and lifestyles and aspirations to influence the way they shaped their environment. The book that I've written is just a starting point. The biggest thing I hope readers will take away from it um, is some knowledge of architecture, but more than that, the desire to go out and see it for themselves. I worked for many years with a historian named Elizabeth Mills Brown, um, who put it perfectly in a talk that she gave once. Architecture is for everyone, and there's enough to go around if we'll only take care of it. We can't write it down on a convenient list that we carry in our pockets, but it's all around you, wherever you go. So go out, keep your eyes open, enjoy every bit of it, whether it's on somebody's list or not, and above all, guard it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.